see if we are going up on YouTube. All right. I think we are live on YouTube. Um, cool. And I'm just going to, you know, give a little bit of caveats here as we wait for people to join us here on the live stream. Um, and then we'll get into our conversation here. But for those of you joining us on YouTube, uh, welcome back to Entrepreneur Struggle. Another week, another conversation. Um, as you've probably noticed lately, we've been kind of sporadic with these conversations, really just working around the schedules of our great guests and also my really busy schedule too. So sorry, we don't have like a regular cadence of when we're having these conversations. But if this is something that you want to be a part of, or you have other people who want to be part of these conversations and be able to you know, be able to interact with us live here. Uh, we really encourage that. We have the comment section here on YouTube where if you type something there, I'll be able to see that. And when the moment feels right, I'll, you know, uh, relay that to Brendan, ask him a question. If you have, yep. especially things that are specific to your own journey and you have questions about, or, you know, maybe you have a comment to, to be able to add to some of the things that we're talking about. We'd love to hear your perspective. So um, for those of you who, who may know other people, let them know that they can join us here live. If you are listening back to a replay of this or watching a replay back of this, uh, do know that you can follow uh, me at DCP Official or at Chris Colbert Report to get updates on when we're doing these conversations. Uh, but we do them here live with you to be able to get that interactiveness. But then also this will be coming out as a podcast um, on the Entrepreneur Struggle feed. So um, if you miss anything, feel free to check out the rest of our conversation there or even here on YouTube. So. Um, we're here talking to another incredible entrepreneur, somebody who um, I was actually connected with through one of our past guests. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of, of that connection a little bit later. But uh, Brendan Kennedy here is somebody who has done um, some incredible work with a, I guess, newish business, you know, uh, in the last, I guess, uh, in terms of going all in on a company just the last two or three years. But I think early on, he started kind of uh, materializing what this company could be. So I wanted to bring Brendan here to talk about the journey of creating a business that's all around travel and sustainability and going beyond just making money, but also making an impact, uh, not only in his industry, but also around the world. So Brendan, thank you so much for joining us here on Entrepreneur Struggle. Yeah, excited to be here, tell the story, and to echo what you said, Chris, if people have questions, I'm, my whole journey, and I think what's most exciting for me is to help people do it better, or in their own journey, avoid some of the pitfalls that I have. So if I can be useful in stuff that we talk about, please write us a question, ask us, and we'll get to it for sure. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we always want to learn like what were the, the the things that led them to success but i think we need to learn I, I think honestly some of the best lessons to learn are the pitfalls the things that maybe i didn't do correctly or the things that i just wasn't eyes wide open on when i came into my industry and so yeah brendan i definitely want to get into that and really starting around like the creation of your business next stop can you tell us about just that journey that led you there and a little bit about the company and, and again that intentionality of how you've created this to be around sustainability and helping the world um, yep. You know, especially during this this era where we have, you know, climate change and, and a lot of issues happening in the world itself yep. in terms of actually affecting the earth. So, yeah, uh, tell us a little bit about that that journey. It's interesting. I spent my entire life after college working as a consultant. So I was flying every single week. Most people who do this type of job. You leave on Monday morning, you fly to the client, you come back on Thursday. And I ended up doing it for many years in a row, two years straight, JFK, LAX, every single week for two years. And I started to think about just what I was wearing, what my uniform was when I was going to the plane, how I wanted it to be super easy to pack. I didn't have that much stuff I could bring with me. It's always a carry on. And I wanted it to be versatile. I wanted it to be comfortable. And most of the times I would fly to LAX, run, get the rental car, hop in the car, drive down to Laguna Beach, and it would be an all day thing. So I wanted to be comfortable, but maybe go straight into the office and have things that were stylish, stylish and versatile. So I started to have this idea for Next Stop maybe in you know about 2012, 2013, but it really wasn't until 2016 when I got a little more serious about it. I finally I was working on another startup at the time uh, when I came out of business school, I was still traveling a lot. And I said, hey, you know, this travel lifestyle, even just beyond this uniform I want for travel, I don't see any company out there that's making travel specific clothing that's a cool company where I want to represent that lifestyle. And I trademarked a couple things that were pretty cool, like the plane logo. Um, we did some airport codes and the very first 
collections I did were sort of people represent their cities or represent kind of jet setting. One of the things that happened was we had Diplo and some of the guys in Mad Decent start to wear the hats. We just had hats. That's the only thing I could do. That's the only thing I had money to put out there with the, <laughs> the airplane logo, which is still obviously our main logo today. And when they started to wear it, it was our first test where I saw, wow, people you know, think this might be cool. And we want to deal with Golden Voice, actually, who's the group that manages Coachella and puts that on. They have a couple other festivals, and they brought us in to do uh, the headwear merchandising for the FYF Fest in LA. And that was the first time where I said, okay, we proved this some celebrities like it. We know that we can get some deals. This is interesting. But it took me at that point, a, a sort of like a stop where I said, this is cool, but what else could it be? What else mm -hmm. is going to make this interesting? And I started to really look inside about what I cared about. Sustainability is a really important topic that came up more and more. Just personally, I travel all the time. I've grown up surfing, sailing, doing everything on the water. And I just kept saying to myself, you know, if there's got to be more to this brand where we can do something innovative and it's not just about the clothing or the lifestyle, but it's about something a little bit more where we can move the needle. And it took me almost two years to learn what sustainability was. I didn't go to school for that. I didn't go to school for fashion. You know, it was a little bit of a testing out to see what this was going to become. And in point of fact, in 2019, I met the CEO of Kelly Slater's brand, which is called Outer Known, and they're deeply and Kelly Slater's oh, a surfer, right? Yeah, Kelly Kelly Slater is effectively like the Michael Jordan of surfing, <laughs> like the, far and away the best surfer that has ever lived. And the fact that know, I know his name means that he must yes, be famous. I don't know any other surfers besides that, but him, right? Well, he dated Pamela Anderson for a while. He was kind of, you know, <laughs> he was he was making his waves in other places, but. He started a brand that was all about sustainability and how that you can really, you know, give back and do things for the earth that you love. I met the CEO of this brand, Mark, at a conference, and he was the first person who kind of connected me into the right places. So we finally had the supply chain ready to go, and I came up with this idea of fusing together sustainability with performance. And that concept became Travel Leisure. So we trademarked Travel Leisure in 2019, almost like Nike dry fit of how we're going to put this together, put a tech piece behind it. And we came into 2020 thinking travel is huge. You know, I was going to leave my full time job to do next stop full time. And in January 2020, I did quit my job and was about ready to come out and do this when COVID hit. Got a little timing. That's the timing, right? So I'll just stop there and say, this was the preamble of putting all the pieces in place. And then we, we came full into the, the COVID time, expecting it to be huge travel, and then that stopped. And yeah, I guess when you were deciding to leave your job, obviously we don't know the pandemic was coming yet. What was it that gave you that confidence to feel like now is the right time to go all in on this? Was it Kelly Slater? <laughs> you know, you're working with big <laughs> brands, big celebrities, like... Yeah, what, what was it that gave you that confidence? I, th I think more than anything, I was actually in Peru uh, at a factory working on some of the samples. And then I sort of came to this decision, it was time to go, because there's only so much you can do part time. You can't, there's not enough hours in the day to dedicate all that you can to a specific, you know, passion. And I think it, it finally come to the point where I had enough money to at least get things moving. And I had the belief that we could make it happen. And I, if I didn't invest enough time to truly push it forward, it was never going to get over the threshold of just a hobby. No, that, that is so true. Like, yeah, we, we keep trying to carve out more time for ourselves. And ultimately, you know, a lot of times we, you have to let something go. And that's, you know, obviously an extreme situation in terms of like, I have to leave this full time job to go full time with this other job, this, you know, business I'm trying to create. But I think it's even with the small things in our lives, even just tasks, like, we keep trying yep. to pile more tasks onto our plate. Well, sometimes that means you have to let go of certain tasks, whether that means delegating them, or, you know, just letting them go all together. But I think that's a really excellent point. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be cliche and you'll hear it from everybody, but time is the most valuable resource you have. And the older you get, the more, I think, hardship you endure 
the more it becomes very clear to you that spending your time where it is most valuable, most fun, most rewarding, most most lucrative is just the most important decision that you can make. And if you don't do that, you waste it in tasks and other stuff that may not really either bring you joy or completely just waste your time and maybe money. So I came to that point and ironically, March 2020, March 7th, we did our photo shoot for the Travel Leisure collections. We just had samples, we didn't have inventory. I remember I filmed the video sitting in the director's chair and the video began as such. We live in a golden age of travel. That was my opening statement for this video. And then next week, everything came slamming to a stop. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So uh, we did, I, I will say I did have an inkling that this was going to happen because in, in February, February 2nd of 2020, my supplier from China came over and I'd started to hear, paying attention about the COVID stuff. We were out for a beer and he says, hey, you know, you." I, well, I said to him, I said, you know, Fred, what's going on with this? with this virus and he's like it is way worse than whatever they're telling you they're saying it's tens of thousands of people it is hundreds of thousands of people wow. and they're going to close everything very soon you wait and sure enough two days later they issued that that lockdown from china and shut all the planes off and it was like from there everything started to spiral but i think it even with that it wasn't clear yet the impact that that was going to have on the united states we were just sort of mm -hmm. thinking hey this is china you know don't worry about it but obviously that that wasn't the case yeah so going into now essentially starting your business like, yes it had already been started behind the scenes but going all in on the company and really you know trying to make these overtures and, and all the work that you're trying to do there as COVID is beginning like how did you deal with that uncertainty of I would assume supply chains and raising money. Like, how did you how did you manage that? Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty hairy for a little while because basically, you know, I was out of a job. It left my job, and then we it spent fifteen thousand dollars on this shoot, and then realized we weren't going to be able to go forward. And it was you know uncertain what was going to happen in the United States. And again, the same guy called me back in the middle of, of March and he said, you know, are you thinking about these face masks? You know, over here, this is really important. Everybody's wearing them. You know, I'm telling you, this is going to be a big deal. And at the same time, I'm talking to a friend of mine in New York who used to run all of the fire safety for Metro North Railroad and Long Island Railroad. And he was telling me, you know, to kind of gauge how serious it was. He's like, listen, man, there's bodies in pickup trucks, dump trucks, like, bodies filled with these things this shit is serious this is going to be really ugly here and this is not going away this is going to get worse so when i kind of heard from him how serious it was and then this guy telling me he had the supply chain you know kim was actually the one uh my partner kim you know who, who you interviewed right she she's she's an interesting person because it takes a lot of time to convince her about certain things and I turned to her and I say, you know, this guy tells me he can do this, but I'm not sure, you know, like I don't have a job. I've got to, like, not sure what to do about money. And she says, you know, you should do this. And I'm so sure that you should do it, that I will give you my money to do so. And I kind of went out for a run and it hit me like a bolt of lightning. And I said, if this is truly this serious and all the travel is going to change, that means everybody in the world is going to need one of these things. And we have this mm -hmm. concept of travel leisure about this performance and sustainability. I've got this guy on the supply chain who's telling me he can do it. I've worked with him for a long time. I know that he's going to he's going to be good. If I can put it together, that means Delta is going to need this. Hotels are going to need this, people everywhere, and we could do it. And I came home and I called them up and said, I want 10,000 units. I want to do bamboo because I want to do something sustainable. Make it happen. And then California went into the lockdown a few days after that. And I called them back and I said, 100,000 units. What can you do? Put it through. I sold everything I had. I liquidated all the stock that I had in, in VMware, who I worked for before. At a very awful time, the stock had cut in half since since they would announced that so i basically sold it all to loss went to some friends got a convertible note done and uh then was introduced to an investment bank th 
through a friend to help me finance the inventory. And we shipped those masks. And sure enough, on April 3rd, we went live on the site. Uh, and then from there, it exploded. And Kim, Kim went out again and got us in front of GQ, Vogue, Esquire. She got to those people and said, Next Stop's got these masks, put us in these features. And we, we absolutely blew up. Yeah, and and you know, Brendan obviously was referring to Kim. Uh, Kim Roach, who uh, was a guest here on Entrepreneur Struggle um, a couple episodes ago, so make sure you go back and check out that episode because she also is an entrepreneur. And so, yep. you know, obviously, you know, she has the same kind of acumen that you have in terms of trying to you know see the long term uh, gains that can be had, and also pivoting when people are panicking. And I think yep. just specific to what you were saying, like, okay, there's that initial panic of, oh crap, like I just sold everything. Well, I hadn't sold everything yet, but like I quit my job. I put myself in this vulnerable position. I just spent $15,000 on this video. And now the business model has to change. And in, instead of just wallowing in that, and yes, you're going to feel that immediate emotion, but then you were able to take that and think with a little bit of clarity and think more long-term and, and also more, even in the here and now of what are people going to need soon? before anybody else does. And so you're able to then pivot the business in being able to now do mass as opposed to, you know, maybe just the, the hats and some of the other merchandise uh, apparel that you were uh, working on before. And was there, I know you said you went for a run. Is that something that you do to help to give yourself that kind of clarity? Cause it, it seems like there was like physical activity in some of these things where you were having these moments of clarity. Yeah. I mean, listen, I am a, a big meditation uh, person. Every day I start with at least 30 to 60 minutes of meditation. The running itself is meditative for me. It's a time when I can, I've had some of my best ideas ever when I'm just out and letting my brain sort of cycle through what those challenges are. And in many of the darkest times as well, when I need to go out and ideate, that's, that's the way I do it because there's just, infinite number of possibilities that can always happen. And there's many times when you're so focused on something that you feel has to happen this way, and then it doesn't, and it puts you into a tailspin and you have to sort of backtrack from that and figure out your way to reset, recenter, and then recall that actually many or if not most things in life don't happen the way you think they're gonna happen. Oh yeah, so I love to say okay. nothing ever happens the way they're planned. <laughs> right, right. So. This is, you learn to deal with it and and adjust. And I think being a startup, yes, we were in a, a position where we were paying attention probably more than everybody else, right? Because it was a travel brand and now travel is stopped. So of course we were really trying to think about what was gonna go on. Then we had the right people and we could pivot and move quickly. And I think for us, keeping the supply chain nimble and being able to pivot and make changes is a secret sauce or for any business being able to pivot and move quickly is is really important and you know no more so than in the the pandemic yeah and your and your partner kim who as we said you know she has her own business but also is an equity she's also an equity partner within uh next stop yep. and so you know, she's helping put in money early on. She is a part of the business till this day. What are some of the challenges working with your partner on a business or even just, you know, and, and I'll say challenges, but also what are some of the positives of that too? Um, and yeah. having an entrepreneurial partner? Well, I'll say, say this. So Kim, in the very beginning of 2020, right, she went all in to help me. In fact, what happened just to continue the story of the mass very briefly is when we got all of the, the, features for Vogue, GQ, and Esquire. That was literally her just brute forcing it to go out there, find those people, email them, and be like, you need to get these guys in your articles because they've got a great product nobody else does. Then she turned around and became a salesperson where she and a lot of her girlfriends, I pulled onto the team and we went out and got wholesale deals. Her friends landed Delta Airlines for us, Age of its Budget Group, Samsung, Blizzard, uh, NASA, they went out there and she was the head of sales for a little while to go do this. And these are just, you know, literally no, none of these women had any experience doing direct sales. They were just hungry <laughs> and they were resourceful and they were like, we want to make money. So <laughs> we grabbed them and did it. <laughs> it's and a nice motivator. That, and that was a nice motivator. I mean, she, she came in and she, she made that happen. 
but I will say that it's important. She is very minimally, if almost not at all, involved in the business now, and that was very much on purpose because to I just think it was selfish, first of all, of me to be asking so much. You know, even though she does have a stake, there's other things. It was becoming a lot more than I think. You know, really an advisor or like a, a part-time kind of help would be. And secondarily, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, I, I think it would be tough to be going through it together as partners in life and partners in business because there's, you're living and breathing all the stuff all the time and it can get really intense. And I think yeah. it's actually been much much better in all senses now that she's helped and at times she comes back and it gives me a hand but now she's doing her own thing and i've got this and then there's these two separate paths that are going forward and it's enough space but it's also involvement and i help her i mean i'm more of like a key grip for her because she does a lot of sound <laughs> healing and other things <laughs> there's not too much i can do at the moment but it's i think that that space is also really important it's not you can't keep calling on that over and over and over again without it, I think, leading to to maybe over over asking. Yeah, and I think, you know, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. I have a mother and a sister who are entrepreneurs and both have had their significant others involved in businesses where they both were leading the company. And it wasn't just like a piece of equity. It was similar to kind of how you all started where, yeah, they're yeah. all running around and doing all the tasks to make this business hopefully successful. And that wears you down quickly. And, and you kind of yeah. touched on it briefly of just like, where does the business relationship end and the, you know, the personal, you know, loving relationship uh, begin and, and end? And that can really get bled. You know, those things tend to bleed. And especially in an early business where you're sinking so much time and resources into it, it's hard to find time to have a relationship if, you know, yep. there is a business involved. So I think it's smart that you all are kind of, you know, I guess, backtracking off that a little bit in terms of like the amount of involvement. But I would also assume that there's got to be some positive to having an entrepreneur as a partner to be able to bounce off each other and be able to relate to each other's struggles and, and just some of the angst that might come along. Yeah, I think that's one thing that I, I've actually had a, a partner in my previous uh, company, Fathoms, which is still going, we raised about a million dollars through the National Science Foundation for a technology platform. It's basically business games for MBA programs. And my partner in that was a professor. He was actually my professor at Stanford. I ran back into him at MIT Business School where he was a professor there. And that was a challenging relationship. It was nice to have a partner there to share the ups and the downs and the burden. And there are times with Next Stop where I wish I did have a true other co-founder who was fully involved, especially, you know, fundraising right now is a very intense process and to expand your network to have more people to have somebody help run the business when those things are are going i think would be great on the other side of it in my previous business you know this guy who's still a friend of mine we just didn't get along in certain ways we did not see eye to eye it was not an e equal partnership because he was really the the creator of the technology and that created a lot of challenges too you know this guy, is, I laugh at him because he was like a tenured professor driving around in a Porsche doing whatever he wants and then telling me to suck it up because you know, that's how <laughs> entrepreneurship is. I'm like, get the hell out of here, man. Like, you, you know, you, this is wild. And then, you know, he didn't want to raise money because he didn't he didn't want to give away control. And he he's a very uh, cautious individual in general. So he wants to think and, you know take all this time and i'm like dude we're gonna be dead of old age before anything happens with this so i saw what it was like to have a partner and when i came to do next stop i've you know done it just as the sole founder i do at times think about what it would be like to have a really the right partner i think would be a great thing uh and in the next business i have whatever it is i think i will really look long and hard to find a co-founder where we really truly see eye to eye and mm -hmm. that that would be quite helpful well and so it's interesting you brought up uh fathomed because as i was like doing my research i saw fathom and I'm like hold on it looks like you you know had started a business before and i was wondering yeah, yeah what had happened there because i saw that 
it doesn't look like you're you're involved there anymore. So I didn't necessarily know what had happened there. But I guess leaving that situation, did that have any, I guess, residue as you were then, you guys, you touched on a little bit of it, but that did that then influence some of the, the uh, did that then influence some of the decisions that you made as you were then starting Next Stop? Uh, it did. I mean, listen, like I said, the, the funny thing is that business is going well and is continuing to grow strong. Like right now, the idea was to build in 10 seconds, fathomed, patented a technology where you could build very simple games to play in your classes on your mobile phone, where the professor could talk about forecasting, pricing, uh, supply chain optimization. You'd play against each other in the class and you could stop the game and say, hey, these are the key things that I'm seeing based on the trends of the game and help you realize the fundamental concepts. It's a very powerful uh, tool. And we got money through the US government to build this. When I left, we were in you know 20 of the top business schools in the world. Now, I think Fathom is in over 100 and working with people like Uber and others who want to have corporate development programs for their executives where they're learning these types of things. So. The really what it came down to, though, is we'd gotten our last amount of money through the government. And then, as I mentioned, my co-founder at the time didn't want to go raise extra money. So there was no more money really for me. There was money to hire some developers. Uh, that said, I took away a lot of important things. I learned how to do trademarks. I submitted all the trademarks for us. On oh, that wow. Company. Now we do all that for next stop. We have the plane logo, travel leisure, pack less, do more. We have four or five airport codes because we were doing that. Um, I learned, you know, because of the rigor of this other guy, handling the uh, expenses and handling a lot of our, you know, uh, legal types of things, I became competent in and, and brought that. Uh, I have, I think, become much more attuned to what it costs these damn lawyers to do a bunch of shit that they say <laughs> they're gonna do. Oh, you spend um, so much money on lawyers. I, I will. I have a plug, though, if I could. There's a if if anybody here is looking for low cost lawyers, there are many groups now that operate as virtual councils only, where you can get access to them on Slack as a flat fee per month for unlimited access for what you do. So I use a group called at Virtual Council, and basically you pay for a tier. You know, like let's say, you know, you want basic uh, help with your HR stuff, or you want corporate documents submitted, uh, that's one tier. Or you want to do fundraising, that's another tier. But instead of it being an hourly rate, it's just a flat fee. And it's way more cost -like. I mean, maybe like 10 times less than wow. you would pay anywhere else. And you get access to these people. It's actually more efficient because you can see they use Basecamp, Slack, all sorts of tools where all your documents are there. You're always in constant communication. And you can basically call on them whenever you want. It's way better than all these these dinosaur lawyers who charge you <laughs> seven hundred bucks an hour to write you emails. Yeah, well, I think that's a great tip because for two reasons, like you were just saying, especially in LA where where you are, where, you know, Southern California, me in New York, like we have such expensive lawyers. Yeah. But also, if you're in the middle of the United States, a lot of times you don't necessarily have access to the kind of lawyers that you want, and this is a great way to be able to connect with the kind oh, yeah. of people that you need. Oh yeah, so we, it's just. Yeah, I'm it, sorry. Works, it works great. It works great. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, uh, th give the name of that one more time, the one that you that you like. I use this group called at Virtual Council, like AT. Like it's literally like the at sign and then AT Virtual Council dot com. I think they're they're great. They just we've used them for several years. We used them for converting us to a, a Delaware C Corp, doing all the, the paperwork submittal for that handling the fundraising now, preparing documents. Um, you know, they helped set us up in Gusto and do some of the things with that. Hiring, onboarding people, writing your employee manuals, like very operational things, but to do it right. So uh, giving you contracts for working with consultants, reviewing your contracts if you need. So I think it's, it's very, very good use of your money if you need it. Good. Well, no, thank you for that. I actually might check it out myself because, yeah, we can always try to save money anywhere we can, uh, yeah. which is where I want to go next in this conversation. But if you are just joining us uh, here on YouTube, we are talking to uh, Brendan Kennedy, who is the founder, CEO of 
uh, Next Stop. He also a uh, former uh, co-founder and and uh, you know partner and and CEO of uh, uh, Fathomed. But uh, you know, Next Stop is what we're focusing on here as we talk about that journey and and kind of creating and uh, scaling up this business through COVID and. During that the, that initial 2020 period where you were you know really going all in on the company, you're pivoting now to doing mass. You talk about you know raising money from friends, from you know your your partner, from other folks. Like, what was that fundraising stress like? Trying to raise money during COVID because I'll preface it by saying we also were raising money in the same time, and we had investors that were committed to us verbally, and we were kind of getting down to the final ends of things. And when, when the pandemic hit, people's portfolios took a hit. And so yeah. some people disappeared. Some people just were feeling uneasy about the media industry for us. But especially for someone who's in the travel apparel industry, there must have been a lot of pushback on somebody looking for money for something like that during that time. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think that uh, it's always challenging with the fundraising. And to be fair, I, I personally think that a lot of these excuses from investors are a bunch of bullshit. Why? Because there's always something going on. There's the pandemic. Then there's the war with Ukraine. Then inflation's going crazy. Before that, it was something else. Like, there's never what, – when is a, a perfect time to give you money? Never. So if they're, if they're giving you excuses because they're full of shit and they're not going to give you money because they were never going to give you money. And a lot of these guys, honestly – don't aren't aren't leads you have these conversations with people and they talk to you and they say oh i lead rounds i do x y and z and they don't and they're never going to do that so i think unfortunately it, in your case if i heard you right is like people maybe said it gave you some oh we're interested or we're going to do this and then they back out you know i don't know i i, I personally think that that's that's was just an excuse for something that was never going to happen but mm -hmm. to answer your direct question we, I think, got, it's all about getting to the right investor. It's, I think when I did this, now I've done it three times, or I'm in the process of doing it for the third time. The first time was, the, quote, unquote, the easiest, because we were so laser focused on what we needed, and we had a very specific ask with people who got it, that they came forward and gave us money. This is why, this is exactly what I mean. In this opportunity with the face masks, which is really what they were giving me money for. They were giving me money to build the face mask business in a time when we knew that face masks were going to be going to be huge. Next Stop is, was a part of that, but really what they're saying is like, we recognize, Brendan, that you have this opportunity for uh, this product right now when everybody in the world needs it. You guys have a first mover advantage and you make one that's going to be sustainable and really good. So when we launched in early April, we were selling into back order tens of thousands of units on our own site. Amazon FBA came to us. Amazon FBA is fulfilled by Amazon. That's the prime program. They okay. came to us because they saw us in GQ and said, do you guys have inventory? We want to bring you into the prime program and we will move all blocks out of the way to get you launched as fast as possible. Uh, and then Kim and her friends found us a couple wholesale deals. So when I came to these investors, I said, I've got all of this demand. I'm literally selling these things faster than I can make them. Amazon's bringing us in, and I've got wholesale orders for several hundred thousand dollars. Give me money so I can ramp up. And the first people who gave me money were my friends. There were some friends who came involved and, and – overnight wired me 50,000 bucks to, to at least get things going. And we signed a convertible note. In the meantime, another friend introduced us to uh, a, a big investment group in Europe. And in the span of like seven days, I had a conversation. I showed them the demand. I showed them what our orders were. And they said, we can do this for you. And you know, they actually wrote us a million dollar loan for it. I only drew down 250,000 bucks. But it was so laser focused on like working capital because we have this demand, give us the money. And it, that was it. Um, I think what happens though at times is there's many investors where you come to them and it's not really their space or you don't really have the demand yet. And even though they, they like all these venture capital guys, at least a lot of them want to tell you that they're venture 
and they're not. They're not venture. You know what they are? They want to be growth capital. They want to be. We know that you're you're far enough along. You're not going to lose our money capital. And yeah. that's not really venture capital. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's got to be a little risk involved here. A little risk, you know. Like, and and it's funny because in uh, last year when I, I had to go and we ended up doing another another loan to put it along. But I was talking to some people and they're like, "Yeah, you know, come back, come back when you're bigger and other things are happening." We'll give you the money. And I'm like, guys, when I'm bigger, I don't need your money. That's the whole exactly. point. <laughs> like, if this is ultra successful and profitable, and I wouldn't need your damn money. But you know, like, all right, <laughs> it's just it's it's wild to me. So what I'd say is, you know, trying to figure out what the who cares about your space a lot, and who knows your space really deeply. And we are, I think, each time going out there to do this, to find and focus on those few. And maybe there's there's more. I mean, if you're in crypto, you could basically do anything right now and people will hand you money. But for other stuff, it's, it's not that way. And I think you need to be really, really laser focused on who could you go to and uh, get them to write you a check. Quickly, if there's any fiddle futs in around, it's already that to me. It's like it's like dating, you know. Like once upon a time, you used to be on Tinder or Bumble, right? And if you if you message and they don't message back right away, or they message back and then it dies off, it's never gonna happen. You're never yeah, gonna see let it person. go. It's the, it's the same. <laughs> it's the same with investors. <laughs> I, I like that analogy, and you, and you're right too, because even if you do happen to get that investor. That's actually probably not a good thing either, because now you're going to have somebody who is tied to your company, you know, equity wise and wants to have input on, you know, even if they don't have like the ability to, to do anything themselves because they're a minority owner, but they're going to want that verbal input of like, why are you doing this this way? And you're going to be yep. wasting time trying to explain things to them. They're going to be giving you bad ideas that you're going to probably, yep. you know, at times maybe implement and then, you know, hate yourself for. So yep. I think that's a really excellent point. Yeah. I mean, it's just you want to have the right people. And at the end of the day, too, I think I don't. You don't just want money. You want connections. You want you want scale. So if you come into somebody who says, "Hey, I can give you money, and I can help you get into this place, or get to these people, or expand into this location," that's really, I think, the most important thing because then it's it's helping you in more ways than just one. And I yep. definitely had friends who've taken money where uh, they didn't they didn't like you know the relationship and later on were pressured to do a lot of things that that became uh, you know, yeah but you bring up awful yeah and you bring up an excellent point of like those strategic partnerships those strategic investors can yeah if they have a media outlet that they can now push your content out to or they have relationships to airlines yeah. or what have you you know yep. in your industry like that's big and so yeah don't just look at investment raising as a, a zero sum game around money like no there's also other uh things that are you know other resources that these people may have yep. that can be a benefit to the business and the growth of the business but even yep. with the ones who are saying no to you like how did you and how do you because i know you're still going through you know fundraising yep. like how do you stay positive in the face of no's like how do you not internalize that going into your next meeting yeah it's it's that's the big challenge right i think that's why the meditation is really important and at the end of the day for all entrepreneurs you do this and you have to be ready for the fact that for the vast majority of the early part of the business, nobody's going to believe you. Nobody's going to believe you. Nobody's going to care. It's not going to go that well. And you have to really believe and feel deep down what it is you're embodying in your success. You need to not just say it, but you need to feel deep down passionately that you are successful this is working not even this is going to work that this worked already past tense and because of that you are already successful and being grateful for it but it is tough i mean yeah when when you hear no's from people especially when you reach out to uh some investors where you think that they may be a great fit and they still give you excuses or say no or drag things along it's definitely not pleasant and it's the type of thing where 
at least I try to focus back in on the business and see what we can always be generating success in the business side to give you that 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 positivity. So, you know, if you if you're out there talking to investors, I think at all times in the business you need to be trying to focus on your business to push it forward and make more money, be more successful, and then that success itself feeds into the other. I mean, if you start to get features and articles or you you land new customers, then you take that to these people and you show them or it better yet is you get PR and earn media and they see it and then it makes your job easier. And I think that mm-hmm. the whole way that you stay positive is you try and put what energy you have. You know, you got to have to brute force it a little bit and go out and find these investors and just keep on them, keep on them. But in the meantime, it's even now turning around to my team and be like, all right, what can what wins can we get this week that are going to help us? What wins are we going to be able to take and and truly show progress? And then that excitement and that that growth is something that helps you in your conversations and helps you keep going. I like that. And speaking of wins, you know, can you uh, let us know maybe some of these more recent wins? It sounds like you've been working with some incredible big brands. And I think I even read about some new ones that you all are going to be working yeah. with. So yeah, wh- yeah, what are some of the, the big things that have been happening lately? It's really cool. Uh, I've been doing a lot of outreach over the last several weeks. And there's some big time CEOs in the travel industry that I'm speaking with to either come on board as as investors and as advisors, Um, some in the apparel and accessories realm, some in the hospitality realm. And then just seeing that validation is cool. We also uh, are going into some of our first retail locations. So interestingly enough, the Army Air Force Exchange, which basically all military bases, all US ones, um, either nearby or sometimes on the bases themselves have retail locations where they've, you know, basically like a store, a store or a mall for all military discount. And we were in touch with them. They want to put us in different, you know, they have thousands of locations all over the place doing the same thing. Now the Navy coast guard side heard about it from the army air force people and now coming to us too. Uh, we're looking to do some other orders, uh, now with a major European airline. Uh, which is really cool. And just in general, I think, you know, we have some celebrity people now that are, are going to be getting involved. So it's it's all these things where you're trying to triangulate this demand. And luckily for us, like, travel is coming back huge, despite inflation or all oh, the yeah. other stuff. I don't think people care. I just, I think they're saying we sat inside for two years. <laughs> you know, we're done. We're going to go out. <laughs> I've been, I've been, I've been on six flights in the last five days. So yes, travel yeah. is back. <laughs> here's, here's, a, here's a question for you. Did you wear a mask on the plane? I did. I still wear my mask. Mm, see, this is a curious thing. So I'm tonight, uh, I have to fly and definitely going to be wearing a mask on the plane. I think forever I will also wear a mask on the plane because I still have not got COVID once since this whole thing has started. I haven't even gotten sick in the last two years. Same. Right? So it's people because they go wild with the mask, like, oh, pinching our freedom and whatever. Okay, you go get sick then. Like I'll wear this, I'll wear this mask, <laughs> which will be mildly annoying. <laughs> I won't get hey, sick. While, while you're also advertising your business. Yes, and also, yeah, we also <laughs> – Candidly, not for a little next stop plug, is we do make literally the world's best travel mask. We were voted that everywhere. Travel and leisure, trip savvy, people. People wrote a whole article on our bamboo masks and how amazing they are. They're literally the best ones in the world for travel. So, yeah, we make them, and you should probably still wear one. So you can find them at nextstop.com. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, you did exactly what I was just about to ask. Where can they you know, stay up to date? So obviously, nextstop.com. Uh, spell it yep. for people, though. Uh, so tell them how, yeah. Yeah, how to spell that, and then also your social media uh, that you'd like yes. people to stay up to date so, on things. So for Next Stop, that's N-X-T-S-T-O-P, right? So no, no E in Next. But the website is www.nextstop. Dot com. Sorry, the next stop.com. See, you already confused me. Um, so if you go to the next stop.com, you can find us. We're also available on Amazon. We have everything basically there too that you can find. We'd love for you to come to our website, of course. Uh, we do offer prime shipping for free through our website, and we have more of our selection available there. So we would encourage that. 
And then our social media is uh, Next Stop Apparel on Instagram. Uh, you can find us there or The Next Stop on TikTok. Great. Well, no, thank you so much, Brendan, for uh, joining us here on Entrepreneur Struggle. And, you know, congratulations. I, I know, you know, it's still there's still so much more to go ahead. But like in these what first two, three years, like you all have done incredible, like, yeah, to be featured in Fortune and People and all these different magazines, but also the brands that you're working with, the celebrities that have, you know, taken a liking to what you all are doing is just absolutely incredible in such a short amount of time. So I just want to, you know, allow you to maybe take a step back. And because I, I know for me, I sometimes, you know, you live in the moment, you're always worrying about what's next, you don't take a chance to step back and look at the wins, like you have a lot of incredible wins. So yeah, congratulations on everything. Well, thank you. I think that's maybe the last piece I'd say for everybody is take the time to feel that gratitude. And, you know, use that when you feel that and you feel grateful for what you've done and you celebrate those wins, you have to celebrate every win. Every little win should be celebrated because especially in the beginning of the business, those wins may be few and far between sometimes and they get more as you go along, but celebrate what you got. And yeah, there's a lot more to come. I would love uh, maybe come back in a couple of years and tell you how we're, we're crushing everybody now as the new uh, sustainable Nike of travel. So we'll see. Ooh, I'd, I'd love that because uh, I still actually had more questions I wanted to ask you. So oh, there'll be yep. still some more saved up and I'm sure I'll have new ones as you all continue this journey. Um, so yeah, again, thank you, Brendan. Thank you for those of you who have joined us, you know, here live on, on YouTube Live. And if you, you know, missed any part of this conversation, it will still be up here on our DCP YouTube page, but we'll also be putting this out as a podcast in the next couple of weeks. Um, you can also follow me at Chris Colbert Report um, and also at DCP Official on all social media platforms. If you follow us, you'll, you know, get updates on when we're having these conversations since they are a little bit sporadic, uh, just planning around these entrepreneurs' busy schedules as well as my busy schedule. Um, but again, even if you miss these conversations, which we do want to get your feedback and have you participate, even if you miss these, you know, you can still check them out later and, and let others know. So yep. until the next uh, Entrepreneur Struggle conversation, stay safe, stay healthy out there. The struggle is real. Thanks. All right. Hang on here. I'm going to end this live stream. So I should be 